Miami, where five of the first 13 Super Bowls were played. On those occasions, it was the Orange Bowl. Now, after a decade's absence, pro football's title contest returns to Miami and Joe Robbie Stadium. This, of course, is a city rocked several days ago by racial violence and unrest. The tension has been eased. The situation is now quiet. But this week's riots were both a reminder of serious and persistent social problems and a source of embarrassment and anxiety for civic leaders and just plain folks in this town who had worked very hard to make Super Bowl week a success and to show off their town in the best possible light. Now, however, Super Bowl Sunday has arrived, and for several hours at least, Miami and the nation can enjoy a big game, remembering, of course, that it's just that, a game. Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Costas. The entire NFL Live crew will be here to help us set the stage for the battle between the Bengals and the 49ers. And the first item of business is the weather. It's been gorgeous all week long. Then yesterday we had some rain, and this morning we had something closer to a monsoon. I mean, it was really coming down. As luck would have it, NBC meteorologist Al Roker is here with the Sunday Today crew, and obviously the sun is shining behind us now. Are we out of the woods? Well, just about. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel, Bob. There are a few chance of a few scattered showers around kickoff, but other than that, we are just looking for very windy conditions. It's going to be very windy. Temperature right now, 79. Game time between 70 and 75. How windy? How bad will the gusts be? Uh, gusts anywhere from 20 to 25, maybe even 30 miles per hour out of the west. And when you say scattered showers, you mean just that. No chance of the torrential rains we had this morning. No, the monsoons are over. They're out into the Atlantic, and it looks like smooth sailing ahead. All right. How about the field conditions? Well, Paul McGuire talked with the head groundskeeper, George Toma, and here's Paul's report. My man. Bobby, I talked to George, the only man that's done all 23 Super Bowls, and George says we rate these fields when we get here. He got here December the 12th. He said we rate them from 1 to 10. December 12th, it was a 4. They believe they have it up to an 8. I said when you get it to 12, sell. I said, what about before the rains? He said, no problem. The rains yesterday, some 12 hours ago, any effect? He said, none. I said, now what if it rains during the course of the game? He said, this field could hold up to a half an inch with no problem at all. It needs rain. Bob? All right, Paul, San Francisco is a touchdown favorite. They come in on a roll, winners of six of their last seven after a mediocre start to the season. The only loss in that closing span came on the last weekend of the regular season when their playoff circumstances had already been determined, so the game was meaningless to them. And they're a hot team now getting hotter. In the playoffs, they buried quality opponents Minnesota and Chicago by 25 points each. A win today would give San Francisco their third Super Bowl title this decade, ensuring the 49ers the designation as the team of the 80s and bolstering the Hall of Fame credentials of Bill Walsh, who could very well be coaching his last game for San Francisco this afternoon. But standing in the way are the Bengals. Overall, they're the league's top offensive machine in 1988, and they were surprisingly effective on defense against both the Seahawks and the Bills in the playoffs. However, there's a major story breaking out of the Bengal camp, and it isn't good from Cincinnati's perspective. With that, here's Gail Gardner. All right, thank you, Bob. An unfortunate set of circumstances for the Bengals. The league announcing today that fullback Stanley Wilson cannot play in the Super Bowl. He is suspended for violating the league's substance abuse policy. Now, the confidentiality of that policy does not allow anyone to reveal what the circumstances of the violation were. But suffice it to say that it did happen recently, that the league found out about it last night. Now, Stanley Wilson has been suspended three times. He was suspended in 1984. He also sat out all of the 87 season. He came back this year. Now, whether or not Stanley Wilson has a future in the NFL will be decided by the league in the weeks ahead. As for the Bengals today, they, they are obviously distressed. And our Jim Gray was able to catch up with wide receiver Chris Collinsworth to ask him about how the team was feeling. Chris, can you tell us about the suspension to Stanley well, Wilson? It will be a distraction. I, I don't think it's going to distract this football team. You know, this is an important football game, and certainly we feel more sorry for Stanley than anybody else. So uh, we hope he can get his life together because he needs to. Can you tell me how the team reacted when they heard? They're all disappointed. Stanley's a good friend. We hope he gets better. All right, perhaps the Bengals can use this as a rallying point this afternoon. Time now to check back with Paul McGuire. He has more on the San Francisco 49ers. Paul? Thank you, Gail. Well, the question in San Francisco would be, are they going to be 100% healthy? Jerry Rice hurt his ankle Monday. Yesterday, he ran extremely well. A little while ago, I had a chance to talk to the All-Pro Center from the San Francisco 49ers, Randy Cross. Randy Cross is retiring after this game, and I said, Randy, 
What about Jerry Rice? Honestly, is he 90, 95 percent? He said, Paul, he ran yesterday better than he ever has. And I know that's good news for San Francisco, but most importantly, it's great news for Joe Montana. How do they feel attitude-wise? Well, they were smiling, talking. But, of course, it's two hours before the game. About 20 minutes before the game, I wouldn't talk to any of them. I'd bite your head off. Bobby? <laughs> well, it's certainly good to see that Paul is <laughs> relaxed and planning to enjoy Super Bowl 23. We might also note that Jerry Rice, two days after the ankle injury was reported, was spotted at a local night spot called Penrods here in town, cutting the rug a little bit. So at that point, I began to believe that he'd be able to make it today in, in the Super Bowl. What about the wins that Al Roker mentioned? You know the stadium better than anybody. Down on the field, how much does it swirl around? Well, the kickers hate this. When, when the wind is swirling, they come out in the pregame warm-up, and I ask them, what goal of, uh, should we defend? And they can't give you an answer because when you look, the flags are going in one direction up on top and down below they're going in another direction. So if the wind continues, this could be a problem. Don Shuley, you've coached in six Super Bowls, innumerable other big games. When a blow is delivered late, like the Stanley Wilson announcement from the Bengal perspective, what effect does it have? Well, the only thing is Cincinnati is used to dealing with it. A couple of weeks ago, they came down uh, with a ruling from the commissioner's office about the no-huddle offense. And what Sam did is he turned that around to an advantage. He helped fire the football mm -hmm. team with that. Now, this has to be unsettling because they were counting on Stanley Wilson, and he had been playing good football. But I'm sure that Sam will deal with this at the top, and then he'll get his football team ready to go and try to use that as some kind of a motivating factor, saying that they have to play harder to compensate for the loss of a Stanley Wilson. Sam's in his first Super Bowl as a head coach, Bill Walsh in his third, but do you ever get used to it? Well, uh, Bill has a real advantage here because uh, he's been through uh, two of these and he's a winner, so the experience factor goes on his side. But uh, Sam, on the other hand, is a very enthusiastic guy. He's creative. And he looks forward to a challenge like this. And this is the ultimate challenge, the pupil against the teacher. But Walsh in his third or Shula in six, you still feel the butterfly. Oh, right? at the beginning, the tension is there. But somehow you have to erase that uh, tension. Once the ball is kicked off, your concentration becomes so great that you forget about the tensions. But before the ball is kicked off, there's a lot of tension. What you do is look for strange and unusual happenings in the locker room. And if, if you spot anything, a ball player that's normally loose being uptight or a ball player that's uptight acting very loose and you try to keep that in your mind you try to settle him down and if you see it's a factor early in a ball game you substitute get him out of there so he doesn't hurt you until he gets settled down all right coach we'll check back with you throughout the day and now when we come back additional words of wisdom on the war of wits between walsh and white From Weich. Later, when Walsh became San Francisco's head coach, he brought Weich along as an assistant. So when Walsh looks across at Weich on the other side of the field this afternoon, he may see more than just an opposing head coach. He may, in fact, see a little bit of himself. Twenty years ago, Sam Weich was with the expansion Bengals. There were many more talented players, but few as attentive. He absorbed the teachings of old master Paul Brown and budding coaching great Bill Walsh. Today, student and teacher come face to face again. Well, I coached him uh, as a quarterback, and I think I helped him with fundamentals and the mechanics of the game and his knowledge of the game. Uh, so from a, from a player coach standpoint, I think he got a, an excellent start with, with us, with the Bengals. Uh, since that time, he Basically, he was indoctrinated in coaching through our organization, through me. I find myself, he has a habit of flipping his fingers up against his palm and, and uh, almost a nervous habit on the field out there. And I have found myself doing that. And I, you know, I'm sure that I, my subconscious is pulling that out uh, from something I've seen Bill do. And I, I have a way of, I've seen pictures of myself standing with my hand up against my uh, chin like Bill does sometimes when he's pondering the next play. And, and I've done that. Only a year ago, Weich's coaching ability was being widely questioned after an apparent tactical error led to the student's disastrous defeat at the hands of the teacher. He called uh, the next day and, and we talked and he commented that, you know, that you did the right thing. Believe me, everybody loses the close ones every now and then and it's a tough pill to take, but uh, hang in there, you're still, you know, you're still a good coach. And, and those are 
things that uh, you need to hear in those few hours following a game like that. When you, you're not questioning yourself, but you're just wondering what in the world uh, went wrong. He handled it beautifully. He handled the whole situation well. I don't know how I'd have handled that. Of course, it's happened to us once, and so I guess I, I can see he handled it better than I did. It was tough. He had a tough year, but you could tell he was, his team was developing. We know that Sam will come out to surprise us. He'll have things up his sleeve, and they'll be extremely well uh, developed, and they'll be imaginative, and they'll be effective. So we know there'll be things we haven't seen from him. Uh, from our part, he knows that we'll keep people off balance any way we can. Let me tell you something. Bill knows that I'm shooting him a few lines. I know he's shooting me a few lines, and it's all in, uh, in the right spirit. It's all in part of the competitive build-up to the game because, believe me, part of the, uh, the competition that takes place in those three and a half hours on Sunday will be uh, uh, set up by uh, the get-ready. And that's what we're doing right now. As you, as you mature and, and develop a certain amount of seasoning, the players become more and more important to you. If some would think that they get further from you, they get closer. You almost get emotional about them, worry about them. They mean a lot to you. So as the years have passed, I've become more concerned about players and the, I suppose the morale of the team, but the state of mind of the people, and a little less on the football. This has been a Cinderella year for us. We've come from nowhere with no expectations from anybody other than ourselves to the Super Bowl. And for us to be able to play the team that really started uh, that criticism uh, with that close loss, I think it's a fitting finish to it. I hope we can win this one this time and write the final chapter. All right, Coach, you've been in both positions as the former pupil coaching against teachers like Weeb Eubank and Paul Brown. And now, of course, all over the NFL are people that either played for you or coached as assistants under you. Your thoughts on the whole teacher-pupil concept? Well, knowing Bill Walsh, he's not going to be outdone by the pupil. And he knows that the pupil is very creative. Uh, he's done some things with a no-huddle offense. Last year when they played each other, Cincinnati was putting a tight end out, and then they would run him off the field and bring a wide receiver in against the strong safety. So the strong safety would go to that side of the field, right, right by the sideline, and the guy would make a quick exit, right. they'd get the mismatch. So Walsh saw this, and he did it to Cincinnati before Cincinnati could do it to them. So I look for San Francisco, if they win the toss, they're liable to come out with a no-huddle offense. They're liable to start to do some of the things that he believes that Sam is going to do that are creative in, in this ball game. And uh, that's what I look for, some, some strange things to happen. So it's even more of a mental chess game when you know the other guy that much better. Right, with these two, and, and knowing how they do know each other and how they love to compete, and, and knowing Bill Walsh and Bill not wanting to be outdone by the pupil. All right, now on the subject of Bill Walsh, our Jim Gray spoke with San Francisco owner Ed DeBartolo. DeBartolo told Gray that he considered it 80% likely that win or lose today, this will be Bill Walsh's last game. DeBartolo then told Gray that his first choice for a replacement is 49er defensive coordinator George Seifert. Jim also tells us that with Marty Schottenheimer on his way to Kansas City, the leading candidate for the head coaching spot in San Diego is former Atlanta Falcon and Tampa Bay Buccaneer head coach Dan Henning, who's currently the offensive coordinator under Joe Gibbs with the Redskins. The other coaching vacancy is in Cleveland, and Browns owner Art Modell told Jim that while they're still a couple of weeks away from a final decision, it's very possible that the inside track belongs to Jet defensive coordinator Bud Carson. Now when we come back, we're going to offer proof that this is not your ordinary Super Bowl pregame show. Hold your breath, folks, because the Diet Pepsi Talent Challenge.